We can expect an unimaginable time of trouble in the last days, such as the world has never seen before. That's what Scripture tells us. But we need not be afraid. His word shaping our story. The year was August 1948, and a young preacher, George Vandeman, was preparing to take the pulpit. As he did so, a Sabbath hush fell over the new grounds as members mixed gratitude with happy hearts for the work accomplished and for their new auditorium. That was 70 years ago, and Central California Conference continues the legacy of Soquel Camp Meeting today. Soquel, an embodiment of America's camp meeting, has become a timeless tradition of faith intersecting with culture, pleasure bursting with praise, and truth uniting with tradition. It is camp meeting time once again. We invite you to join us as we worship our Creator together and let our stories and the stories that are yet to come be shaped yet again. Good morning. A beautiful morning it is today. It's good to see you all here. And as Pastor Jerry was mentioning, it's good to have lots of people listening all of, over live stream, the blessing of technology. Uh, this morning, I'd like us to look at a story that has been fascinating to me recently. It's not a story I've heard very many sermons preached about. Um, it's the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Before we begin, let's bow our heads and pray. Father in heaven, we're so grateful to you for the way you're leading in our lives. We're so grateful because we can be here at camp meeting, and we're grateful because you have spoken to us through your word. So this morning, would you please speak to us again? Help us to understand what you want us to know and how we can be saved. We thank you so much that you are willing and able, and you will do this. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you have heard stories about St. Peter at the Pearly Gates. They're not real stories, they're jokes. Um, for example, one that I had particularly like is the one where St. Peter sits at the gate and a gentleman comes up with a large briefcase. And St. Peter, as he often does in these jokes, says, sir, what can I do for you? Uh, what would you like? Um, he says, well, I'd like to get into heaven, of course. And he says, okay. Um, let me check your name. And he says, everything's good to go. What's in that suitcase? You can't bring that in here. And he says, oh, yes, please, I have to bring this in. And Peter says, well, what's in there? And reluctantly, the man opens up his, his suitcase. And here inside the suitcase are uh, several chunks of gold. And St. Peter looks at the gold. And he says, really? You're breaking pavement in here? <laughs> These are the types of stories that lots of us have grown up hearing. The interesting thing that I learned recently is that these stories are not recent. They come from way back during the time of Jesus, before the time of Jesus, because this style and this type of pearly gate stories have been being told Sent by the rabbis since before Jesus. Um, this story of the rich man and Lazarus is one of those stories. The only difference that you and I will notice is the fact that instead of a Saint Peter at the gate, there's a different character there. Abraham is at the gate. Let's take a look at that. Come with me to uh, excuse me, Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. And we're going to walk through this fascinating tale. Luke chapter 16, starting with verse 19. It says, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Interesting way to start this story. This is the third in a trio of stories about rich people. The first is the prodigal son who was wealthy but wasted his money on uh, frivolous things and then came back home. The second story is the parable of the unjust steward, which scripture says wasted all his goods. 
This is the third story, and it's about a rich man, and we'll find out that he's also wasting something precious. It's not his money, although he's not using it well. It's his life. This rich man is dressed in purple and fine linen every day. Purple, of course, you know, is the color of royalty. But for him to be dressed in purple every day means that not only is he wealthy, he's flaunting it. I am wealthy, I am wearing purple, not just once in a while at special occasions, but every day. Fine linen, he has the best undergarments in the world. This is what linen was used for. Everywhere he walks, he's reminded of, he reminds himself and he reminds everyone else, I am rich and I know it, and you should respect that. Interesting way for Jesus to start this parable. But more interesting to me is the next line. It says, he fared sumptuously every day. This means he feasted every day. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Sabbath. Every day means seven days a week. This gentleman here, this rich man, is a Jew. But if he's faring sumptuously every day, it means that he is not keeping the Sabbath. Do you see that? His servants have to make his food for him, and he's faring sumptuously. It's not that he's eating a nice snack on Sabbath. He's feasting on Sabbath. This is not a uh, typical Jewish man who's following all the traditions and all the laws. He's breaking them. The next verse says this. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, at the gate of the rich man. This is interesting because in no other parable does Jesus name a character. This parable has two characters with names. The first one is this one, Lazarus. The name Lazarus means the one who God helps. The one who God helps. The other character in this who is named, we already mentioned, Abraham. He's the Peter at the gate. This beggar is named Lazarus, and he's full of sores, and every day he is laid at the gate. In other words, his friends bring him to the gate of this rich man and lay him down there in hopes that the rich man will take pity on him because as the wealthiest man in town, it is his responsibility to take care of the poor, which is why the Lazarus's friends do the best thing they can and carry him every day to the gate of this rich man's house, hoping above hopes that maybe the rich man will feed him today. He's laying at the gate. Only rich people have gates around the house. It's uh, to keep the dogs inside. It's also just another statement, I'm wealthy, I have a gate. The house is close to the gate. Lazarus is laying down right in front of the gate. This is what we know about the ancient Near East, about how the way homes were built. And every day, Lazarus is listening and he can hear the partying and the feasting inside the house. And the next verse tells us that Lazarus' greatest desire is to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Ellen White says that this was the attitude of the rich man. If the poor, loathsome specimen of humanity could be comforted by beholding him as he entered the gate, the rich man was willing that he should remain. In other words, the rich man said, you know, I'm not going to help him out. But if he likes to look at me and it makes him happy, then fine. This is not a very good rich man. Yet the listeners listening would have the mindset that, well, that's his prerogative. He's wealthy. He's rich. He can do what he wants. He wants the crumbs from the master's table. That was dog food back then. He wishes that he could eat dog food. They would have little particle crumbs and they would give those to the dogs at the end. This is what Lazarus really wishes for. And what does he get instead? Verse 21, he desires to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, or but, the dogs came and licked his sores. 
The rich man does not take care of Lazarus, who it is his responsibility to take care of. But the rich man's dogs do the best that they can to take care of Lazarus. What does, a, what does your dog do if you're feeling sad? It comes over and it cuddles with you. It maybe licks you a little bit. It's doing its best to comfort you. And that's exactly what the dogs are doing here. In fact, it's very interesting that back then, people thought that dogs, if a dog licked you, it had healing powers. People would go to places and pay extravagant amounts of money to be licked by a dog so it could heal their sores. I thought that was very interesting. And then I, re then I did some more research and found out that scientists have actually said that dog saliva actually does have some healing powers when it comes to wounds. So it's very interesting that the dogs here are doing their best to help Lazarus and in fact are doing more than this rich man. This does not set this man up very well. And we'll see that right now. Verse 22. So it was, remember this is St. Peter at the Gate type of story. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom. This is the place of honor. At the Last Supper Jesus ate with his disciples, Scripture tells us that John was on Jesus' bosom. Laying down around the table in the way that they would eat, John's head would have been resting on Jesus' chest all the way around the circle of disciples. That was the place of honor. That was the place that the disciples were always fighting to have, the place of honor at Jesus' right side at the table. And here, of all the people, Poor beggar man Lazarus has the place of honor laying on Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Less dramatic. And being in torments in Hades or in hell, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. This is another reason we, we know that this is just a story. There is no way that at the end of time, we will be able to look down and see the people over here and they'll be able to look over and see, the, see us up there. It's a parable. What happens next is very interesting. If you didn't think this story was strange already, take a look at this. Verse 24. He, the rich man, the main character in the story, cried out and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he might dip the tongue of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. Have mercy on me. First of all, he says this, Father Abraham. Why does he call him that? This rich man is a Jew. Abraham is, just, is his father. And he's trying to plead his case by, being, by reminding Abraham that he's related. Father Abraham. At the judgment, though, it doesn't matter who you're related to, does it? Just having a family name does not give you any advantages in the judgment. Simply because you're called a Christian or a Seventh-day Adventist does not give you any advantages in the judgment. Ellen White reminds us that this man is not praying to God, but to Abraham. He shows that he placed Abraham above God, and he relied on Abraham for salvation instead of God. In other words, he's relying on his own religion, his own status, his own family for his salvation, and forgetting that the only way to be saved is to rely on God. Have mercy on me. This is fascinating. Do you remember what Bartimaeus says? The blind man that Jesus healed. What does Bartimaeus say when he comes up and the crowd is coming and he sees Jesus and he finds out who it is? He says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And here's the same thing that the rich man is saying. Do you see the, 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 the picture turning for, Abra for the rich man? The rich man has now become the beggar. And Lazarus has become the favored one. Again, Lazarus meaning the one who God helps. Have mercy on me.
And then he says, send Lazarus. There are four problems with this statement. Send Lazarus. First of all, it's fascinating that he knows Lazarus' name. This is the beggar that sat at his gate that he never helped. Only his dogs would help the beggar, but he would not help the beggar. But suddenly, now that he's in trouble and he sees Lazarus up here and he's in torments, he says, send Lazarus. He knows his name. He knew who this man was. It wasn't that he didn't see him. It wasn't that he didn't know him. It's just that he didn't care. Send Lazarus. Second of all, this rich man is at the final judgment. By the way, it's interesting that the rich man is not named. Lazarus is, Abraham is. The rich man does not have a name. He does not need a name because his actions speak louder than his name. The rich man is at the final judgment. He sees his eternal fate, death. He is dying. Don't you think especially since he can somehow shout across this chasm that he might try to make amends, apologize to Lazarus, ask him for his forgiveness. I'm so sorry I mistreated you. Do you hear any of that in the story? Not at all. He's just as arrogant as he ever was. In fact, the third problem here is that he does not even address Lazarus. He does not say, Lazarus, would you help me? He says, Father Abraham, you send Lazarus to help me. He will not talk to anyone of a lower class than he is. Even now, at the final judgment, he only addresses Abraham. And fourth, the biggest problem of all, is that the rich man still thinks he is above Lazarus because he is treating him like a slave. You send him here. You send him there. Look, Lazarus is doing so well now. Well, send him over to help me. And now that I'm in a bad place, clearly, the rich man has not repented. And so it will be at the final judgment. People will acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, but they will not repent of their actions. Listen to Abraham's response. Verse 25, but Abraham said, son. Technon, son. The, the affectionate way to refer to somebody. If he was speaking Spanish, he might have said, hijo. My son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. You received God's blessings while you were living, and Lazarus had a hard life. But indeed the last will be first, and the first will be last. Jesus said indeed it is very hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And besides all this, verse 26, besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, a giant chasm between you and us. And those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. The great gulf is fixed. The decision has already been made. Again, Ellen White, when the voice of God awakes the dead, he will come from the grave with the same appetites and passions. The rich man is not at all transformed by seeing his fate. This is why fear never works as a tactic to win souls. The rich man sees his fate. He's in the fate. He's in the fires of hell in this parable. And he does not repent. It does not change his mind. The decision has already been made. If we can live without Christ in this world, he will live without us in the better world. The more I look through this story, every line, something is even more fascinating. And here we find the climax of the story. Still verse 26. Besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. So that, listen carefully, those who want to pass from here to you cannot. Nor can those from there pass to us. 
Did you hear that? Those who want to pass from here, heaven, to you, hell, cannot. Who in their right mind wants to pass from here to there? Somebody. Abraham says those who want to. It's clearly not the rich man because he's in the wrong place to be able to go back and forth. It's not Abraham because he is the one saying that somebody wants to go. Who is the only one that wants to pass from here to there? It's the only one left in the story. It's Lazarus. Lazarus wants to go from heaven, where he is at the seat of honor in Abraham's bosom, down to the pit of hell to help out this rich man who never helped him. This tells us something huge about the character of Lazarus and tells us why he is in Abraham's bosom. Lazarus is patient, he's long suffering, definitely, and compassionate. Here he sees a man who mistreated him immensely on earth. And instead of shouting at him and saying, it serves you right. You know my name now, but you won't even help me. You didn't even give me scraps from your table. Your dogs treated me better than you did. Now you're being tormented and that's just what you deserve. He remains silent through his suffering. I was reading a book by a man named Kenneth Bailey who lived in the Middle East and learned the cultures and customs of this day. He looks at this story through Middle Eastern eyes in a way that listeners may have heard it told as well. And he says this. This is what he imagines. This is not what happened. This is his imagining. I think it's very helpful, though. He says this. Lazarus is whispering in Abraham's ear and saying something like, Father Abraham, that's, that's my old neighbor down there. We've known each other for years. That poor man, he's in such a fix. We have plenty of water here, and, and well, if it pleases you, I'll be glad to go take a glass of water down to him. Of course, remember, this is a story. It's a parable. This is not something that actually happened. So we can think a little bit more about how this may have played out. But imagine... Here's a man who was mistreated by the rich man all these years. The man knew his name but never helped him, never gave him even the crumbs from his table. The dogs had compassion on Lazarus, but the rich man did not. This man, Lazarus, is willing to leave the comforts of heaven, willing to leave his place of honor at the first feast he's had in forever and go down to the bottomless pit and give a gift to the rich man, a gift that won't do him any good because he's already made his final decision. That's love. But isn't that what Jesus did for us? left the glories of heaven to come down to our planet to give us a gift that most of us either already rejected or would reject? Do you see why this parable fascinates me the more I look at it? This is the same type of love Christ calls us to show to others. Notice here, Lazarus is showing Christ-like love. But we have a final judgment picture. Lazarus here, the rich man there. Jesus meant for this parable to be an example to us of the difference between those who will enter the kingdom of heaven and those who will not. The story doesn't end there. Verse 27, the rich man is still talking. I beg you, he's begging again, therefore, Father, he's still trying to use his religion or his status to gain um, favors. I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him, he's still treating Lazarus like a slave. He's saying, just send him there and send him here. He's just seen love and he still rejects it. Again, the final decision is final. The final judgment is final. 
He says that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Finally, finally this rich man does something for someone other than himself. He has five brothers, likely just as wealthy, just as rich, just as privileged as he is. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them lest they come to this place of torment. What is Abraham's response? It's pivotal to us. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. What is he saying? They have the Bible. They have the Old Testament. Let them hear them. It's interesting that he says, don't, he doesn't say, let them read them. He says, let them hear them. Why is this? Because at this time during history, the majority of Israel is illiterate. Where do they go to read scriptures? Some of them were literate. We know that Mary taught Jesus and that she was definitely literate. Jesus could read the scriptures. But many of them were illiterate. So where would they go to hear the scriptures? To the synagogue. What is the problem with this picture? They don't go to the synagogue. They feast sumptuously every day, Sunday through Sabbath. They're not going to the synagogue on the Sabbath. They're staying home and feasting. They cannot go to the synagogue and hear the scriptures because they're not going. And this is what Abraham says. He says, no, Father Abraham, which, by the way, is very rude to say to an elder. No, Father Abraham. But if, if he gets a bright idea, if one goes to them, from the dead, they will surely repent. But Abraham says, if they did not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. This is foreshadowing Jesus' death, of course. It's also foreshadowing a man named Lazarus who would rise from the dead, or perhaps already had, but the Jewish nation would still not believe. Even more, Jesus would rise from the dead, and many in the Jewish na nation and throughout the world would not and still do not believe. Miracles do not equal belief. If your relationship with Jesus is based on miracles, look for higher ground. Find a solid foundation to build your faith upon. If they did not hear Moses and the prophets, this book, they will not be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. And that is how the story ends. And I look at that and I say, what a strange story. The big picture I see in this story is all about character. Again, from Christ's Object Lessons, the closing scenes of Earth's history are portrayed in the closing of the rich man's history. The rich man claimed, she says, to be a son of Abraham, but he was separated by Abraham by an impassable gulf. Notice what she says that gulf was. A character wrongly developed. Friends, there are so many lessons in this story. I want to mention three of those this morning. There are many more. The more I look at this, I wonder why we haven't preached this sermon, this, this parable more often. I think it's because we struggle to get around the fact that this is just a story and not a real, real event. And it's hard to portray that. But there's so much in here. Here's the first thing. We've already touched on this. The last judgment is final. How we live today determines which side we are on. How the rich man lived when he was alive, didn't care for the poor man, didn't care for Lazarus, determined where he woke up in the judgment. Our decision is 
Will we accept the gift Jesus gives us? Will we allow him to quench our thirst with the water of life? Or will we drink from the polluted streams of this world? Will we allow him to live in us and through us? Or will we choose to do things our way? At the end of time or the end of our life, whichever comes first, our decision will have been made. Not by our words, not by our presence in a church building or the presence of our name on a nominating committee report, but by our actions. Second, we are not saved by name. This is the second point of this story. The rich man thought that since he was related to Father Abraham, it didn't matter what he did, it didn't matter whatever, he, he considered himself related to Abraham, and so therefore he would be saved. That's what he thought. He woke up to a very alternate reality, didn't he? We are not saved by name. We are not saved by nationality or our position. We aren't even saved because we are a Seventh-day Adventist. Your name being on the church books, yourself sitting in a pew, that does not mean anything in the final judgment. It's good to do. God calls us to do it. But there are many things God calls us to do that are simply because we love him and he wants us to represent him and he wants to use us to serve him. What matters in the final judgment is the state of our hearts. Amen. Have you let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus? Have you let Christ be formed within is it not I who lives, but Christ who now lives in me? Have you asked Jesus to come into your heart today? Will you tomorrow? Have you followed the promptings of his Holy Spirit? It's important to belong to God's family of believers. It's important to be part of God's end time movement. It's important to be a Seventh-day Adventist, yes, but unless Jesus is living inside of your heart and you're following him completely, these things, as important as they are, won't matter at all if that one thing is missing. Make sure that Jesus is living inside of you. Here's the third point. We are called to serve every human out of love for them no matter what they've done. That's the difficult part of this story, honestly. It's simple to know that the judgment is final. It's troubling but easy to understand that we are not saved by name but by the character of our hearts. By if we have allowed Jesus to live inside of our heart or not, it's him that saves us, not my own works. But this one is difficult because it requires me to do something. It requires me to not be like the rich man, but to be like Lazarus instead. We are called to serve every human out of love for them, no matter what they've done. The example of Lazarus and the example of Jesus is not simply recorded to give us warm feelings about the joy of salvation. These feelings are good, but it must go farther than feelings. Each of us, I know because I'm a human just like you. <laughs> Each of us have people in our lives who, when we think of them, give us negative feelings. Am I right? We remember a time when they mistreated us, or we remember a story we heard about them. Even worse, because it's a story. We are called to forgive these people, and yes, most of us have done that. That's easy, in quotes. Sure, I forgive them. Maybe even, I forgive you. But we are called to go beyond mere forgiveness. Lazarus, in this story, goes beyond mere forgiveness. Forgiveness. God is calling us today to intentionally serve those people out of love. This phrase, I've double underlined this in my Bible, those who want to pass from here to you cannot. 
Are we willing to do that for others? Do we want to leave our comforts, our own mentality, our, our, our comfort zone, and step across the gulf to serve somebody who probably will not appreciate what we've done for them at all? Maybe there's someone who's wronged you and you've said the words, I, I forgive you, but they still bring up negative emotions when you see them. Pray for ways you can serve that person out of love. Maybe there's someone who has done something so bad that you can't safely trust them again. And that's a real thing. You may not be able to trust them, but God is still calling you to serve them out of love. So if you ask him, he will show you what you can do. I'm not asking you to put yourself in a dangerous position. But pray and ask God how he wants you to serve these people who bring up negative emotions in your mind out of love. Maybe, maybe it's a church member, someone you have something against, or someone who just simply tends to make you angry. God is calling you to, like Lazarus in this story, serve them out of love for them, not expecting anything in return, and not even expecting them to change. Did the rich man change when Lazarus showed love to him and was willing to go down to help him out? Not at all. Not at all. The judgment was final. There wasn't anything Lazarus could have done, but he wanted to, if he could. But how many of us, when we see somebody who's done something very wrong, have the mindset that we wish we could do something to help them still? What will you do? This is a hard teaching. It's a lot easier to say, I forgive you, than to actually do things to serve people who have done you wrong out of love for them. And it's a lot easier to decide that you love someone than to actually serve them. Forgiveness is pivotal. Maybe you're at that stage and you need to forgive somebody. Do that. Loving them comes next. And after you have that love for them, which only Christ can give you, by the way, it doesn't come from yourself because that's not anything that can come from you, then ask God to help you to serve that person out of love for them, expecting nothing in return, but knowing that because Jesus loves you so much and he's showed you this self-sacrificing love, which he definitely has on the cross, you also can show this kind of love to them. Again, this is very hard to do. In fact, I only know of one way to do this. Only one. Scripture only knows of one way to do this. It's Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, when Jesus is living in your heart, when you've let his mind be yours, let yourself be crucified and invited Jesus to live inside of you, it is only then that you can truly forgive, truly love, truly serve out of love. He gives you the strength to cross the chasm. Do you want this kind of strength? Then pray with me. Father in heaven, it is so hard as humans to love those who have wronged us, mistreated us. But in this parable, you've shown us that this is the type of love that you need us to have. This is the type of love that stands in the final judgment. So God, we are asking you this morning, won't you please give us this kind of love? Help us to realize that the judgment, the final judgment is final. Today is the day of salvation. Help us to re remember that you are calling us to something greater. You are calling us to serve people out of love for you without anything in return. 
Father, please give us this kind of love because we do not have it. Come and live inside of us so that we can serve you in the way you want us to. Help us to be willing to do that. And Father, help us not to depend on our status, our status as a pastor, our status as a church leader, our status as a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, our status as a Christian, and think that that is what will save us because only you save us. We need you to live inside of us. We need you to live through us. So please come and live inside of me. Come and live inside of each person listening this morning. And help us to be shaped and molded into your character. This is our prayer. And we're excited because this is what you want to do for us. And so we ask that you would do this. In Jesus' name, amen. We would like to thank the constituency of the Central California Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church for making this program possible and from viewers just like you. Thank you.